Thank you for joining us and God bless you. Just gonna open up in prayer. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I just ask that you would bless the hearer, bless the word, and let it minister into their life and encourage them, Lord. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and glory. Amen. So I have titled my uh, sermon, This Time I Will Praise the Lord. You know, God has a very unique purpose for your life. And you're not here by mistake. He is going to get you to your destiny. Even though sometimes we feel like we're never going to get there. But he is. He is working all things together for good for those who love him and that are called according to his purpose. And that's you. And what God has purposed for you will come to pass. However, there are times when we think nothing good could come of this situation. But as you grow in the Lord, you'll know that even the really, really rough times have great purpose and exceeding value in your life. When we feel totally alone and at the end of our rope, that's when we need to be reassured that Jesus is deeply moved by what you're going through and that he promises that he is working everything together for good for you. Amen? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. That's us. We're servants of the Lord. Okay. So with that in mind, I thought we should have a little look in the book of Genesis. And we're going to look into a young woman's life. So in this story, there was a, a young woman, a sister wife, yes, I said sister wife, and an unloving husband. I'd like you to turn, if you would, into Genesis chapter 29, verse 14. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seem like only a few days to him because of his great love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. We'll pause for a moment. When Jacob suggested that he work for seven years to marry the younger daughter, Rachel, Laban was more than happy to agree. What a deal, free labor. And then, hold on, wait a minute. With a little finessing and maybe a little extra wine, he could do a bait and switch. Let's go back to verse 22. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. And of course, that was the, the big wedding event. But when evening came, he took his daughter, Leah, and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob made love to her. Now, back in the day, young, young ladies were married off in their teens, in their quite early teens. But Leah had passed the typical age of marriage. And she'd actually become, you know, uh, somewhat of a burden to her parents. And she would have likely felt like quite an eyesore 
She was still not married, still had no children. All her other peers were already married with kids. That wasn't where she was. And she was still living with her parents. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. That was her story. She was homely looking too, kind of simple. And we're told she had these oversized eyes and some translations suggest that her name actually was translated as cow's eyes because of how her odd her eyes looked. And her little sister was the one with all the looks. Rachel had that shapely figure and, and was lovely to look at as the Bible even tells us. And if the Bible tells you something, then it's, you gotta trust it. And, uh, she was also, uh, Rachel was also the more forward of the two. Leo was quiet and used to taking second place to the pretty younger sister who also happened to be a shepherdess. Wow, what else can't she do, right? She's perfect and all the guys like her and she's out there and she can do everything. Anyway, then one day out of the blue, along comes this very handsome young man named Jacob and he quickly became the talk of the town. And he's staying in their home. I can imagine Leah might have had a secret crush on him, but there was no way she was going to let him know. It soon became clear, however, that he had a crush on her sister. What else is new? And now it's been declared that Jacob would work for seven years to marry her sister, Rachel. And Rachel just seemed to be the type that was just getting everything and anything she wanted. Seemed like she never really had to work for anything or to know what it was to be overlooked or ignored or rejected. As the years went by, there was still no, suit, no suitors coming to seek Leah's hand in marriage. And her parents often could be heard discussing their unmarried daughter, Leah. Now in those days, marriage was what justified a woman's worth. She really had very little value outside of marriage. So it was a very difficult place for Leah to be. The plans were coming together, however, for the very long awaited wedding, seven years between Jacob and Rachel. You know, the invitations had gone out, the menu was decided, accommodations were being prepared for the newlywed couple. Um, I'm sure the cake was arranged, everything was done, the food, the drink, uh, everything was bought. Even the band was ordered. I bet you they had bands back then, why not? They all danced. Anyway, Rachel was floating on air as everything was nicely falling into uh, place. And she would soon marry the great love of her life and start their lives together as husband and wife. However, the night before the wedding, Laban's scheme began to unfold. He called for Leah. He informed her that she, not Rachel, would marry Jacob tomorrow. Can you imagine the absolute horrified shock and sick feeling that would have come over Leah? How could she do this? And why would he even ask her to do something like this? But she knew why. It was to get rid of her. She was a public embarrassment to her parents. And this was their way of fixing that once and for all. And regardless of all the hurricane it would create, her sister would be devastated and think that Leah must have known about this all along. And Jacob would most certainly, when he saw who she was, reject her, not want her at all. And I'm sure Leah pleaded with her parents not to make her go through with this, providing every reason under the sun, uh, even perhaps pointing out Laban's promise and how this might reflect on his good character. But his mind was made up and Leah had absolutely no choice but to obey her father's command. Let's go back to verse 22. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast, that was the wedding. 
But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I've served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? And Laban replied, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week. Then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah and then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. Let's jump to verse 30. Jacob made love to Rachel also, because remember the week had, all they asked for was let her have a week of, of wedding and then you can, have, uh, you can have Rachel. So one week a bride, you're supposed to be a bride for a whole year, one week a bride and, um, and then suddenly Rachel is now his bride as well, sister wives. So getting back to verse 30, Jacob made love to Rachel also, for his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. You know, most of us have experienced times in our lives where things have gone terribly wrong, and poor Leah, I don't think anything could have gone worse than that, that absolutely humiliating experience. And like Leah's life, Maybe you can relate on some level. Perhaps you felt like you've maybe never really had a fair chance and, and that you're not living the life that you thought you should be living by now. And it seems as though others live such happy lives, right? You always look at, um, look at everyone else and it looks like they've got it together and they're so happy and content, but not you. Like, I didn't sign up for this, but that was where Leah was. And we find ourselves in situations different than that, but where we can understand. Let's go to Psalm chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, Amen. a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Amen. And you know, this when you're in that terrible, horrible place and just nothing seems right, it's the Lord that is our strength and our refuge, our stronghold in times of trouble. He is the one that will get you through and carry you through these very horrible, difficult, and challenging times. And we, we have to allow the Lord to use you in whatever state life finds you wherever you're at and it's not easy and it does take faith and to trust the lord to choose to do what's right rather than to react in anger to our circumstances we have to wait and watch the lord work a masterpiece out of your life uh, you know sometimes what we think is a mess god will transform you may not get what you think you should get but God will create beauty out of your ashes. And people are watching your life and you don't realize what they're seeing. You're seeing failure, trauma, tragedy, uh, but they're seeing courage, strength, and resilience. Amen. Let's get back to verse 31 in our reading in Genesis chapter 29. When the, Lord, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, I mean, that's it. The Bible's saying it right there. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. But Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave this one too. So she named him Simeon. And again, she conceived, 
And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So she named him Levi. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. And all the previous child's children that she had, she grieved, hoping that this would be enough. This would justify her love. Jacob would acknowledge that she was truly a wonderful woman and, and that he loved her and seeing mother and child. And then up to three boys. I mean, what a thing. Three men to, to take on the heritage and and to take his name, and surely she's done enough to win his love, but apparently not. And she began to understand that, you know, I'm not gonna be able to depend on this man, Jacob, for his love and his attention and his affection. So this time I will praise the Lord. And it's quite amazing that she named him Judah, and we'll talk about that in a bit. It took a, a, a little while for her to realize that regardless of the thoughts and actions of family and her friends and everybody else, that she's going to have to praise the Lord. She's going to have to praise the Lord for her own sanity, for her own strength, for her own sense of well-being. In Psalm 16, verse five to eight, we read, you, Lord, are all I have. Have you felt like that before? You know, you have family, you have friends, you have work colleagues, you have, you have uh, folks that you know, but there are times in our life where we can truly say, Lord, you're all I have. And you give me all I need. My future is in your hands. And thank God it is. Thank God it's not in those unloving husbands' hands or in uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves, but that we rest. Our future is in your hands. Goes on to say, how wonderful are your gifts to me. How good they are. I praise the Lord because he guides me in the night, in my conscience, warns me. I am always aware of the Lord's presence. He is near and nothing can shake me. You know, when your foundation is in the Lord, truly, the winds can blow. You can be hurt, you can be discouraged, you can be really even heartbroken. But the security of knowing that God has you that he is speaking to your heart and showing you which way to go and sharing his love for you, that he is near and that you know he is with you. You're not alone, amen? amen. This time, she says, this time I will praise the Lord. You know, we can go over and over every horrible, hurtful, and cruel thing that's ever been done to us. Yes. And we can relive every word, every miserable, heartless act of others until we've become really emotionally crippled. Just can't do anything. Just hearing it over and over and just living in it and just um, dwelling in it, accepting it, um, taking on ownership of that situation. And you know, that's not what God has for us. That is, that is the devil deceiving us into um, wanting us to believe that's our um, that's our story. It's all we're ever going to be. You're never going to be enough. You're always going to be in lack. You'll never measure up. You'll never be as good as all the others. And um, I'm sure Leah have, could, could have continued down that very road until there was nothing much left of her. But instead, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. Leah was an overcomer. Regardless of the ongoing disappointments, she raised seven God-honoring and loving children. She learned to trust in the Lord as she gave uh, her strength to stay faithful and true 
to her position as a wife and a mother, regardless of what things were like coming at her. She stayed true to the position that she was in. And how did Jacob feel about Leah? Well, if you continue on to verse 29, we read something really interesting. It says, then he, that's Jacob, gave them these instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham brought along with the field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. Amen. Amen. Do you hear what happened there? He chose to be buried with his wife, Leah. Not with the one that he said he loved so dearly all those years and went on had many children with, but he chose to be laid and to be recognized by the whole world as husband and wife to Leah. And I would say that's because of her commitment to serve God in whatever situation she was in and to bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times, the word says. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, even when it's rough, even when it's horrible. My soul shall make its boast not in my husband, not in my kids, not in the house I got, Amen. not in the awesome job or my degree, yep. none of those things. But my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. And you know, when you're hurting, you're pretty humble. Mm -hmm. You're really relying on God as your strength. Amen. Amen. Maybe you never got that job promotion that you worked for. Or maybe you were taken advantage in an investment scheme or lost everything. Maybe you've been sick most of your life. Some have faced public embarrassment. Families have let you down. You're estranged with your children. Financial bank bankruptcies, or like Leah, have lived in a loveless marriage. Verse 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Amen. Thank God. We're never alone. Yes, amen. I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Those are his words. But I love this. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I'm guaranteeing you there were times that Leah felt that way. And I know there are times that you have felt that way. It says, goes on to say, the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. God sees the intent of your heart, and he rewards those who seek to do good. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Do it with all your strength, and do it to the Lord and not unto man. You see, she could have stayed in this, this really, you know, loveless, thankless marriage. And she could have been looking to her husband and just growing bitter and bitter and horrible. And, and, but God's word says, wherever you're at, it says whatsoever you're doing, whatever you're doing, do it with all the gusto you've got. Do it with energy and do it as unto the Lord, not as unto man. And God will get you through it because the reward is then from the Lord, not from the earthly things that let us down. As much as we love our families and our spouses and our children, they were never designed to completely fulfill us. Only God is able to do that. And he's the one who defines who we are. 
not mankind. Oh, she's married now. She's legit. That she's now justified. Oh, she's had kids now. She's she's a well-rounded woman. Oh, she's got a great job. No, all of these. No, it's God right. who defines who we are, Amen. and He loves us unconditionally. Leah was blessed by God with six sons and a daughter, and one of those seven children we talked about that was judah and judah was listed in matthew as part of the genealogy for king david king david became her great 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 grandson imagine that the woman who lived in a loveless marriage would go on to have the greatest king of all time and greater than that Jesus himself, King Jesus himself, came through the lion of the tribe of Judah. He was the lion, rather, of the tribe of Judah. His great, 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 great grandmother was Leah. Not Rachel, Leah. God honored Leah. Leah may have not been Jacob's choice, but God chose to play a role that she would have for all future, that we would all be blessed in because of Leah's faithfulness. We have the Lord Jesus. In her trials, Leah chose to praise and be thankful for God's role in her life. Jeremiah 31.3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's God's love for you. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. So through all the difficult times, I have drawn you into myself and I have loved you so much. And my love never fails, never weakens, Amen. never is disappointed in you. It is unfailing, forever secure love. Thank you, Lord, for that. Remember, our praise is never determined by our circumstance. It's solely, completely, and totally based in the awe and the wonderfulness of our Lord. What he's done, who he is, and what he's yet to do. This is why we can praise him. Because it's not based on earthly things that will pass away. But it's based upon, solely upon, the amazing wonder of who God is and what he's been to you in your life. You know, Leah could have become bitter to the point of death. She could have died an early life. You know, bitterness leads to early death. It creates stress and cancer and all kinds of horrible diseases. And yet she outlived her younger, pretty, perfect sister. She outlived her. She could have given up, but she made the very best of her life. Uh, and our challenge today is to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord and to praise him in whatever circumstances, whether we think they're fair, reasonable, right, whatever they are, to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord and to praise him in whatever circumstances that we find ourselves in. And, you know, I, I was just thinking, I, I saw another scripture that, that blessed me. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, and that's right back there in our challenge. Rejoice always, pray continually. That's communing with God, that's talking with God, having him in your thoughts, sharing what's going on, rejoicing, sharing with God, talking with God, and then give thanks where? In all circumstances. Not because, Lord, thank you for this horrible marriage. Thank you that I feel unloved. Um, thank you that I'm seeing a couple over there sitting on a bench and they just look so in love. Thank you. No, not that kind of thank you. Why are we thanking him? We're thanking God for who he is. We're thanking him for his, that he will work all things together for good. Even though in the here and the now, sometimes we don't see it. But God is working on our behalf. And it says, for this, God's, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You wanna be in the will of God? That's what he wants. Amen. He wants you to be joyful. He wants you to rejoice. 
to pray, keep chatting and talking with the Lord, bringing things before him in prayer, and to give thanks wherever you are, not dependent on the world, but dependent on God. Amen. Amen. I hope this blesses you and encourages you today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the uh, scriptures and the story about Leah and the life that she lived and what an inspiration that she is, Father, that she chose to, to honor you and to praise you and exalt you through her circumstances and that you worked all things together for good as you will and do in our lives and as we have seen your hand in our lives faithfully and continually blessing us. And so, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for who you are, dear Jesus. And we just continue to bless your holy name and invite you as our Lord and Savior to move and have your being in our life. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.